Iowa's News Now Sports brings you black and gold glory. Your all-access pass to all things Hawkeyes. This is Eye on the Hawks. And this is episode three of Eye on the Hawks. Thanks for joining us tonight. It is Mitch Fick with Owen Sebring, Mike Howell uh, running everything behind the scenes. Uh, thanks to everybody who watched Thursday's edition, looking at Beth Getz, our first time getting to talk to her and hear from her uh, two weeks into her time as interim athletic director. Uh, we didn't talk about this in that episode. We will say real quick for this one as we get back to the football side of things, thank you to everybody uh, that has been supporting the podcast since we launched last Sunday. Uh, we're over a 1,000 views on that first episode on YouTube. I think we've more than tripled Twitter mm. followers from like 21 to 70-some. Progress is progress. Uh, downloads have been great. So just we put this out there, and you never really know how things are getting engaged within the algorithms and you yeah. know, get lost in the shuffle. Uh, I've heard nothing but great feedback on stuff uh, in terms of like the little clips we're posting and everything. So it's for everyone who's been supporting, awesome. Thank you so much. You don't have to smash that follow button. It, you, should be be safe. you should be safe with your phone. You know, that's smashing true. is true. a strong word. But Especially you know, if you're on your parents' it. phone plan still, that's not <laughs> your phone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I think, the beauty of this podcast is that like, it's largely centering around conversations that are happening in the newsroom, regardless between me, you, and Mike. And so it's like just putting the microphones in front of us, and um, that's, I think, what hopefully makes it uh, listenable and enjoyable for everybody. You're getting a little um, little sneak peek into our 2 p.m., 2.30, 3 p.m. after this the meeting is, yeah. discussions. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing scripts, turning around, having an in-depth conversation about why the 2009 offense was incredible, like, stuff like that. I'm just making up numbers. But uh, we do have actual football developments to talk about, folks. We have an AP preseason top 25 poll to chill down your spine. Just incredible. Iowa clocking in at number 25, technically up nine spots from where they finished in the end of 2022 poll. You figure with the additions and subtractions, eh, makes sense. I don't know. Uh, you've also got uh, a few Big Ten teams all around there. Michigan, uh, number two, Ohio State, three, Penn State, seven, Wisconsin, 19, rounding out the Big Ten uh, appearances in the top 25 proper. You've also got, I believe, Minnesota in there at technically 38th receiving votes. Illinois tied for 43rd. There's 49 teams in the, uh, in the AP total if you count all the teams receiving votes. There were 40 just for reference in the end of year one for the 2022 season. Your reaction to Iowa being 25th from you or Mike? Um, it's a big important thing. Why don't I defer to Mike for, for now? 25 sure is better that. than 26 in the coach's poll. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, numerically, absolutely. Yeah. I, when when I saw that, I'm like, you know, we'll have a number by our name in the first game. That's that's pretty cool. Um, when you look at all the teams on there, you, you see a lot of the usual suspects. Um, I think everyone, every college football fan is in agreement that these polls shouldn't come out until week three or four, but yeah. they do come out, so at least we're getting some hype. Yeah. I... I one of my biggest surprises, I guess, was to see Michigan all the way up at number two. I mean, I guess theoretically it makes sense based on last year's results, but um, I don't know, with Harbaugh maybe having to miss some games that's, as head coach this year? That's not happening now. They announced that earlier this week. That he's good to go. It sounds like he's good to go. Really? Okay. I know that they denied now, his yeah. self-imposed sanctions or whatever. but Sounds like he, uh, he shouldn't miss so time. So he's in there. So um, but then right. two first-place votes behind yeah. Michigan's name as well. I mean, and I think Ohio State got the last one, Georgia yep. with everything else. Yep, and so that, that surprised me a little bit to see both those guys in the, in the top three, but then just, so what, four, te- four Big Ten teams in the top 25 um, as a whole? Five, um, counting Iowa. Wait, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio Penn State, State. Penn State, Wisconsin, Wisconsin Penn State. Yeah, yeah, I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. So I'm going to recap real quick the end of the year in 2022. We just said Iowa finished 34th. You had uh, the end of year last year. This, I'm just going to go Big Ten West because we know Michigan and, Michigan, or Michigan and Ohio State are really super uber good. But let's look at the West real quick. So Iowa finished last year 34th in the country. Purdue 36th, the defending West champs. Illinois was 40th. Minnesota, we talked about this uh, during run-throughs. Minnesota was the top-ranked Big Ten West team at the end of last season, 30th. There's a team missing that I didn't say. Wisconsin wasn't ranked and didn't get oh, yeah. a single vote hmm. at the end of last year. And now they're 19th in the country. That's wild. And their new head coach, they're new switching their coach. offense. They're going to, offense. you know, the air raid in quotes. Tanner Mordecai is in from SMU. Tanner Mordecai has put up numbers through uh-huh. nine touchdowns against Houston in a game last year. They've got two wide receiver transfers from Cincy that followed Coach Fickle over. they got a really good receiver, uh, Bryson Green out of Okie State. 
Um, they got a kid from USC that pay, played sparingly for the Trojans. But if you're looking at last year's AP poll, the end of year one, you had 40 teams in there. Wisconsin, not one of them. If you're saying at the very best, at 7-6, and six, winning their bowl game against an Okie State team that didn't have Spencer Sanders, that they're at the very best, the 41st best team ending last year. Do you think what they added, losing, losing Jim Leonard, I think is a big deal hmm. on top of changing offense and everything. Yeah. That's a 22-spot jump for a team that went 6-6 six and six regular season. It seems like the, it's just one of those almost like courtesy. It's, it's Wisconsin. And yeah, it's Luke like they're, they're a team that's always going to be uh, the, the front runner for the Big Ten West almost no matter what the year is. Um, not even necessarily saying that's in my mind, but I think just in the minds that's, of That's the expectation, voters. though, is that you're always in the West. Exactly. So, so I think it's just like regardless, Wisconsin always get, is always going to be in that spot. Because everybody else didn't really move. Again, Iowa jumped nine spots from where they finished. Purdue finished 36. They're not ranked, didn't get any votes. Uh, Illinois finished 40th down to 43. Uh, Minnesota finished 30th. They uh, got enough vo- votes to be. 30. Those nine spots Iowa jumped, is that all because of Cade McNamara? Because, I mean, the quarterback's such an important position. Well, yeah, position. you look at it, yeah, addition, you've got the additions of, of Cade, Eric All, Seth Anderson, uh, Rusty Feth. Nick Jackson. Nick Jackson, um, Dejon Parker. I, I will continue to beat that drum. I think Dejon, if he's healthy, will, will be great. But obviously, you lose Jack Campbell. You lose Riley Moss. You lose Sam Laporta. You lose Kayvon Merriweather. You lose Seth Benson. So yeah, addition by subtract or addition and subtraction. You're not <laughs> losing Jack Campbell and adding anything. Uh, but I think Jay Higgins and Kyler Fisher are going to be more than all right in the in the linebacking core. Yeah, it feels like you you've improved because Cade, assuming he's healthy, we haven't heard any updates yet. But that's that's an absolute upgrade. And then you add Seth, and uh, you get a healthy Devontae Vines and or Deontay Vines and everybody else. Truth be told, and you guys tell me if you disagree here. I, of those names that you listed, of the guys who left. To me, Jack Campbell is the only name that's like, okay, yes, that is not a guy who's like re- replaceable or is going to be replaced this year with like an e- equivalent talent. I mean, obviously Sam Laporte is great, but like we we've got a couple of tight ends this year who have a potential to be great too. Like I think that again, potential is the key word. And, and Lachey's shown Lachey's stuff. Show, Eric, Eric yeah. Stone, Sam's going to be a day one starter in Detroit. I mean, yeah. they were raving about him at Allen Park. They love that kid. It's just. You take away – he was the leading receiver for Iowa right. the last two years. We'll talk more about that in a little so, bit. So, overall, yeah, I mean, that's that's why I say that it's, you know, it's not just Cade. It's the fact that, like, you know, of the major pieces that left, you know, J- Jack's the only one that is, you know, a huge loss. From he us. wasn't Lucas Van Ness the highest draft pick? And uh, is, I'm is a Backer fan, so that's yeah, why I brought that up. But, the kid but still, the D-line – so easy to not yeah. even think about. The D-line, coming back, though, like, I have no um, – I have like no doubt that they're gonna yeah. produce just as well. I mean, they're they're pretty deep too, yeah. from what we saw. Tara Smith coming in and out of JUCO, and he's a fantastic uh, again product at a lot of good things uh, at the junior college level. Noah Shannon's still up in the air. We don't know, but again, yeah, it's one of those. That's maybe the the spot that you have arguably the most confidence of any spot on the defense, and maybe you could argue every unit across the the board, with the exception of punting. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mike went in and, and put a bunch of online polls together. I think we got some really good traction on these, but let's. Uh, one of them was the the top twenty five. I believe what the expectation is for the end of the season, Mike. Yeah. So the first, I, I put five in a in a, um, a web story. I'm, I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna do this every week. Hopefully, That's just get yeah, for sure. get some viewer interaction. And the first one is I was ranked twenty fifth. We just talked about it in the AP poll at the start of the season. Where do you think they finish the poll? So I, I let it. You know, I put top five. 6 to 15, 16 to 25, and unranked. What did what would you guys vote in that first off? I'm curious to ask. I think I went 16 to 25. I think I did too. My, I guess my barometer, if I had to set one, it feels like if you finish in the top 15, that's, for me, that's a good spot to do. Sure. So I guess that would, what, make me 6 to 15? Is that the option? Yeah. And that's the majority of Hawkeye yeah. fans who, who commented on the polls. Uh, 31% mm-hmm. think that. And then the next highest is unranked. So I don't know if that's just because the Cade injury happened over the weekend. It's very <laughs> Yeah. They watched that quad or whatever it may be, that, that, that soft tissue uh, injury. Again, we don't have any updates on that yet uh, as of Thursday as we, as we record this. But we'll, we'll see. But, yeah, I, you know, what is that now? 57% of people assume some sort of top, top yeah. five rank. Or, uh, Still a majority ranking, think we're going to end ranked. Outside the top five. But, yeah, you've got yeah. 70% of people uh, with high expectations. The next- as well, they should be, we said. The next question I thought was interesting. I put all the games on there, and what football game, Iowa football game, are you looking forward to the most? What's, what's your guys' answer first, by the way? 
What'd I put say? Penn State. Yeah, it, playing. It, it's going to be the biggest God's game. Is huge. CBS it's on, too. It's on CBS, so <laughs> please watch. Thank you. For, um, that, that'll be a big one. And I also think anytime you go to Madison, that's always a big one. And then Wrigley. That's, I, so I've just given say, three answers. Yeah. I, I voted Northwestern on that sure. one just because I'm looking forward to that Wrigley game. Yeah, those are all good answers, so and uh, I haven't oh, looked at this yet. Up like that, that's cool. Yeah. So I guess Wisconsin is your your main one, and I think that's what I think that's just it's a super easy trip. I think if you're just thinking it logistically, yeah, um, yeah you go to Madison, a cool college town. You get to play at Camp Randall, uh, big rivalry game. Obviously, you love to see that. Ames uh, for Iowa State will be great. Penn State. I'm surprised. Yeah, Northwestern only got eight percent. I yeah. think people maybe forget they, that it's I know. at Wrigley. I should have put at Wrigley Field in there. Yeah, I don't know if there's enough characters. The should have put that. NW. Yeah. Um, no votes for Utah State or Western. Okay. Or Rutgers. Um, the the or funny Rutgers. story behind this poll is I was going to leave off Utah State and Western Michigan and oh, Rutgers, that, yeah. <laughs> and Mitch was like, what's the other game that's on there? I'm like, oh, Rutgers, because I don't think anyone's going to be excited for it. respect to everything happening there in uh, the Scataway, but. After all the turmoil at Iowa State, too, especially over the last couple of weeks, I'm sure a lot of folks are looking forward to that trip over to Ames, hoping for yeah. hoping some numbers, yeah. numbers out there. From Cyhawk to uh, Peacock. Yeah, the third not question. Official yet, but. Not official I I didn't get the tweet up, but Brent McMurphy from The Athletic, right? He works there? or uh, Action Network. Action Network, okay. He um, released you know, TV times or TV networks for, for games and times, and he has Iowa playing on two, which he's been pretty accurate with his reporting. Yeah. Two Peacock games. Um, so I asked, um, you know, they could be streaming on Peacock this year. Are you going to get a subscription to watch? That would be Peacock. Uh, it's Michigan State at Iowa on September 30th, and then that uh, that Northwestern game at Wrigley Field, yep. which I believe is November 4th or 5th, that first week in November. Yeah, and the fans, uh, it looks like they, they're saying no. Uh, 59%. <laughs> which I do not believe, unless you just know somebody who has Peacock or you're going to go to an establishment that's going to stream it. Mike and I, do you have Peacock? Uh, no. This isn't an ad for Peacock, by the way. Yeah, this is- <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> are, am I being paid by Peacock? Because they're, you're missing not- out on a lot of quality programming <laughs> from your friends at NBC. Uh, no. Mike um, and I have it. We both watch Premier League, and that's – so a lot of people right. have asked about, like – almost exclusively on there now, I think, yeah. this season. And people have asked, like, well, you know, can you re- re-watch games and things like that? As far as I know, at least on the Premier League side, you can watch. So if you yep. miss the Iowa game on there, you uh, can get it. I think it's, what, six bucks with ads to get – Peacock, without ads, it's like eleven. But if you're a student, it's it's one ninety nine. It so it does feel oh, if you have like an Iowa you Iowa dot Yeah, I don't know how that works out since I'm not a student anymore. But it's like Facebook, you need to get your kid or your or your brother or your sister to get on their account. True. You know, people just got in a lot of trouble for using their family members to log into certain things, Mike. Let's, uh, <laughs> it let's d- maybe not encourage that. People really don't like nepotism in any. That's what my friend said. It's not me. Talked about. It yeah. does feel like one of those things where everybody says no right now, and then like day of the game, you kind of sure forget, and you're you don't have any plans. You're like, oh, God, I guess I'll download it and pay for it just for they this. They also game. have every episode of Thirty Rock. This is me pitching you on Peacock now. <laughs> Thirty Rock. I know you love Thirty Rock. Big Rock, Thirty Rock that band. stuff. Yeah. So, it's it, we talked about this too. It's probably an easy thing that you could sign up right before the Michigan State game. And then cancel your subscription after Northwestern, and if you get it with ads, it's twelve bucks for two months of access. So, again, not an ad. <laughs> Next question. Next question is the last two are kind of about stats. Yeah. Uh, who do you think will lead Iowa in tackles this year? Uh, we put the safeties and linebackers because those are generally who. Sure. Uh, although afterwards, me and Owen were talking, we probably should have put Cooper on here. Just, but it's uh, Nick Jackson, Sebastian Castro, Xavier Nwamka, uh, Quinn Schulte, Kyler Fisher, or Jay Higgins. So who do you guys think? I'm Wampa, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I can't a, say his name. Sorry. I'm going to lean Wampa. Nick just because he's got 300-some already. I mean, yeah. that's just me leaning on numbers. If I if I had to pick somebody to maybe challenge for that, it would be Jay. I, I think Jay's played, and and Kyler's good too. But Jay, Jay will be right in there. He's played a ton of football, um, and that's just – he's in a spot where – I think I'd go with Nick stuff. Yeah. as well. That my vote was for I Nick. I'd go Nick, yeah. Survey says – Show me – Nick Jackson, I've Nick and Jay, yep. and then uh, Kyler and Quinn oh, right. came up. Is it? It just changed. It went from thirty, or is that just a, slow? Is this a live poll? Yeah, I, yeah. I think with uh, thirty-one and thirty, it goes back and forth because it. Okay, so this is a uh, flawed poll, certainly, huh. but no. Um, yeah, I think I think Seb could be a dark horse to lead in PBUs, and maybe that's just recency bias. Watching that Kentucky game where he was in on every pass. Um, but that's gonna be that'll be interesting. But yeah, I, I think if I think you could uh, really build by just having Nick and Jay 
fighting for that top spot. Not that they're actually going to be duking it out, trying to beat each other in the tackle category. But if, if you've got competition for them battling for that top tackling spot, I think you're in good shape as a defense. Got Gimli and Legless there in the secondary battling. Out of <laughs> okay. uh, last question. Okay, go oh, ahead. sorry. <laughs> well, last question is another stats based one and it's who's going to lead receiving that's a big topic this offseason sure. who's going to be the receivers this year so we put uh luke lachey seth anderson nico Ragini, eric all deontay vines or other we put another which yes i think i voted for eric all when i filled out this poll myself i don't know oh do we have actual like stuff to fill out oh i didn't click i see I, what you're saying this yeah, is me we, we actually went you know and went through myself, it yeah. i can't be involved i had to yeah. i had to bow <laughs> out yeah have to be uh i'm a big I, th- I think De- Deontay Vines is going to have a, a breakout year, so I that's what that. I put. Yeah, I really hope so. I would say either Luke or Seth, and I think it might just come down to Seth having one or two big plays, mm-hmm. kind of like uh, Mir used to do. I mean, he can take the top off. We've seen yeah. that. But we also saw Devon, uh, Deontay do that. So. so who do we got? We got Luke and Eric, both the tight ends. Yeah, big I, favorites. I, and then Nico at third. I, you, He kind of got swallowed up in, in Laporta just because of – what we watched Sam do, but look at a really good year. I think he he was had five t- touchdowns. I'm saying y'all, that's yeah. what I'm saying. He's, uh, mm-hmm. he's a good one. Uh, of course, Eric, we know what Eric can do, and man, I maybe Caleb Brown goes off somehow uh, in that fourth spot in the that wide receiver fourth well, spot. That's why I was wondering the who, other one. Yeah, when people put other, who they're thinking of? I mean, is it just Caleb? That they're Steve thinking? Stilianos, boys, tight yeah. end three. <laughs> you know, maybe. You know, I was listening to the Hawk Central podcast with Lysteco and um, an yeah. And this is not an ad, but but they do a good job. Um, this morning, their new one that came out, sure. they, one, um, they said um, Caleb Johnson has a goal of having 300 yards receiving this year. That's one of his main goals. Out of the backfield. Wow. Yeah, that would be – if that's happening, then, you know, I would expect I would have a very good season. That would be nice to get going. Where would that have stood – if he had 300 th- receiving yards, where would that have stood last year in terms of leading receivers? Would that be like number two? And that's a great segue into my <laughs> trivia question. <laughs> Sam Laporta in 2022 led the Hawkeyes in receiving with 657 yards. Oh. Tell okay. me in the Ference era what year – let me rephrase. I, you'd think that's how hyped I was, was about this. I would <laughs> fra- learn how to phrase it. Correctly. Criticizing my phrasing what is, for what is the what is the lowest number of receiving yards, ballpark of about fifty yards, to lead the team in receiving in the Kirk Ferentz era? Tell me the player in the year too, if you can. And it wasn't last year. I it was not last. It's. A, I will tell you that again, Ferentz era. It's been in the last fifteen years. It's going to be a year though that might surprise. But you. you're asking for the, the the yard total. Give me a yardage total within fifty. Let's start there. Okay. I'm going to say like twelve hundred fifty. For one individual leading the team, what is the lowest number? It was not. Oh, the lowest number. I thought you meant. We're not overall. talking McNutt. No. <laughs> I I would say somewhere like five twenty or something like that. Get your initial guess. Yeah. Um. I don't want to say 519, but <laughs> 400. Mike's closer. Cavante Martin Manley in 2013 led Iowa in receiving with 388. Wow. Yards. That is not only the lowest of the Kirk Ferentz era, it is the second lowest we've seen in the Ferentz or Fry era. The hmm. only total lower, 1979, Hayden's first year, <laughs> Keith Chappelle with 340 yards. Who could forget. Dave Moritz had 390 in 1981. Other than that, everything's been wow. at least like 450 or that. For a little uh, comparison, um, Nick Easley in 2017 was the leading receiver with 530 yards. Riley McCarron uh, had 517 in 2016. He had that had that big 75 uh, yard touchdown against Nebraska to really pump those numbers up. But Cavante Martin Manley, hmm. 388 in 2013. A, a little, it was. The wealth was being spread by Jay Crudock in 2013, though. You had five players with at least 270 yards receiving. I believe it was doing this off the top of my head. Uh, Martin Manley, uh, the late, great Damon Bullock, uh, Damon Powell, the speed demon from Snow Valley uh, Community College, I believe he was from, uh, C.J. Fedorowicz, and, oh, shoot, who was the uh, – there was either a second tight end in there or – some other receiver that's blanking on me. Shame on me. Uh, but nine players had at least 100 yards in 2013 for the Hawkeyes, including a young man who was a freshman named George Kittle. So there were five guys just all between, what, what were the numbers you said, 280 Two, and 270 three? and 288. So I'm going to wow. see if I can get those, uh, those numbers up. We'll do this 
live. I had these all up next to me at sportsreference.com. Vandenberg and Tavon Smith were on that roster. Tavon were... Smith was was the was the other guy that had at least 270. Again, shame on me. I lived out of state. I wasn't following as closely as I should have. But, <laughs> um, yeah, Tavon had 24, 24 catches for 310. So he was the second leading receiver on that team. CJ had 299. Jake Doozy had 270, excuse me. Damon Bullock had 173, but he had a, he had a big catch against uh, Michigan State right before the half in, in 2013. I was covering the Spartans. That's the way I remember that vividly because that was the only Hawkeye highlight I had to put in my <laughs> – Jacob Hillier. Uh, Jacob Hillier. Two touchdowns. It was a solid, solid one in there. Had some nice catches in that 2015 season. Wow. Uh, down Don there. Shumpert. <laughs> Don, <laughs> who's – up 182. Don Shumpert, folks, um, the forgotten man, number eight, has carved out a real nice uh, coaching career for himself. Is that right? You want to go Google Don Shumpert? He's, I think he might still be with the Cardinals or the Giants, oh, one of those two. But he's he's had a really nice coaching career. So, shout out to Donnie for uh, for making things happen there in the league. Assistant running back coach for the Arizona Cardinals. There you go. Yeah, and th- it's probably like his fifth or sixth season in in the NFL. He's he's had a really nice career. It's been cool to see. No uh, thousand yard rushers that year either. No, I, Weissman uh, Weissman was the leading rusher. That was. I'm just about to ask if you can name the Weissman for Heisman. You want, yeah, you want to tell me about 2013? <laughs> what I took away from that season? A fullback who walked on at Air Force at first, can and will be the top running back. Mm. We'll, we'll have to have a, uh, a discussion about the – I don't even know if I want to mention his name, but that was back during the era of the angry Iowa running back hating God. Oh, yeah. Um, basically the uh, – yeah. <laughs> basically the the Iowa football equivalent of the villain from Harry Potter, who I will not speak his name. Mm. There you go. We're off track now. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, John Budmayer is in Iowa now. He's a special assistant to the head coach. Uh, big reason why Cade and Deacon Hill are in Iowa City. He was the OC and quarterbacks coach in uh, Wisconsin for a number of years, was the OC at Colorado State before then coming over uh, to be kind of an analyst for Iowa last year. Now he's in this special assistant to the head coach position. Uh, again, a, a lot of folks – Curious about him just because he's not officially on the coaching staff, but obviously has a wealth of not just knowledge and ability and talent, but uh, certainly influence getting two transfer quarterbacks and especially uh, QB1 and possibly QB2, depending on uh, Joey Labus's health. But here's uh, John Budmayer, who I wouldn't have even thought would be made available for media day unless somebody asks, hence the, uh, the curiosity about him. He talked about just what makes Cade special. That's a relationship that goes way back, even though Cade didn't initially go to Wisconsin. They've stayed in touch and certainly a big part of his road to Iowa City. So here's Bud Mayer. I think what, what he does a good job of just from what I've you know, been able to see with, within the building and, and around the field is, is that he, he doesn't isolate anybody. You know, he, he tries to connect with the whole group, whether it's guys up front, guys on the edges, guys he's going to be throwing to, guys that he's trying to bring along from a, you know, younger guys and get up to speed and crosses over, you know, to the other side of the ball. You know, I know he's roommates with Joe Evans and, you know, they hit it off and, and he, he has a connection with the whole group. So I think obviously he's trying to build a chemistry from a football standpoint and a timing and build rhythm. But I think what he, one of his strengths is, is, is he doesn't just put himself, you know, in, into a hole of, I'm, I'm just going to be around these guys. He tries to not only make himself available, but go out of his way uh, to reach different guys, different ages, and that's a strength of a quarterback because you, it takes the whole team. You know, it's not just going to be that can change real quick. You know, who's out there with you, who's on the other side of the ball, who you're counting on, and uh, they want to know that their leader's connected with all of them, and I think that's a strength of his. I do feel like there's a right way and a wrong way to go about that as a, a new sheriff in town, so to speak, of a new quarterback coming in with with experience and pedigree and coming. A, and, and it feels like Cade's done it the right way, certainly of not ostracizing anybody, kind of putting his, his stamp on things. Granted, a trip to California will get anybody singing the right tune, I imagine. But <laughs> it feels like he has not only come in and been like, hey, I'm, I'm the guy. I'm going to embrace everybody here. But they've embraced him back. So he's clearly doing something right. And, again, you can't hear enough uh, good things from John Bedmayer about Cade. Yeah. Uh, naturally, within any college or pro team or even a high school team, you know, everybody knows the right things to say about their teammates or each other or their quarterback or whatever. But you do get the sense when you go around and talk to the players that Cade is a good rallier and he's just kind of the focus. I mean, they talked about it. It's like as soon as he walks in the room, like everybody just wants to go talk to him. Like he's just, and to which I said, yeah, same with the media too. Uh, <laughs> you see, Cade, that's where we're going. Um, but yeah, he just seems like a guy that draws people to him and uh, just fills that leadership role perfectly. And the big thing about him, too, not just being somebody who uh, has people gravitate to him, but, of course, 
he's a winner. That's a, a big appeal of his, too, leading Michigan to the 2021 Big Ten Championship. His stats that year uh, included one big number that we haven't seen the type of since Ricky Stanzi in 2010. We're talking completion percentage. I'm going to get it up here so I know it uh, specifically. His completion percentage in that 2021 season, I believe, waiting, waiting, waiting. He's got it. Was something like, it was like 64.2%, which is 0.1% more than we saw from Ricky in 2010. So the last time we had a completion percentage of that high, his career completion percentage, I think, is 63.1, which is one full percent lower than Ricky. You can tell I've looked at this stuff. Accuracy is a big deal. Newsflash. And uh, John talked about that quite a bit of what um, accuracy can mean when it comes to not just Cade, but that entire quarterback room. When you have an accurate group, you can spend a lot of time on understanding reads, understanding yeah. decisions, and playing the game and situations where the ball's at on the field, what type of calls are coming in, what to expect. It helps them play a lot faster. And like I said, plays for their strengths because when you have an accurate quarterback, then uh, the rest of it you can spend a lot of your time on. You're not trying to fix a lot mechanically. It's a little thing, but it's a big thing. Last two years, Iowa quarterbacks combined, I believe, have averaged 55% completion. And that's the difference between going 13 of 25 and 15 of 25. And a team like Iowa, who, again, 25 passes a game, that's maybe what they would average. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's not a team that wants to run the ball and establish the line of scrimmage that those extra two completions get you from 55% to 65%. Those are two throws on third downs that needs to be completed to keep a drive alive. It doesn't seem like a lot, but those two throws, so to speak, metaphorically, can make all the difference in the world. Those are two more sustained drives maybe. That gets you 14 more points. 25 gets in there if we want to talk about the, the magic number, so to speak. But yeah. accuracy is, is something, and again, we haven't seen it, but we haven't seen it not always not lead to success because you talk about Nate Stanley, a guy who threw a lot of deep balls, completed a lot of deep balls, never threw for more than 60% completion percentage, but he finished basically behind Chuck Long in every major passing category in, in Iowa history. So if you can hit the long ball, it helps you out a little bit, but Iowa wants to be that short intermediate passing game and maybe hit the deep ball that we saw a little bit in scrimmage. But boy, yeah, to, to John's point there, you, you start getting accurate quarterbacks and throughout the room, one less thing you got to worry about and you can start, uh, focusing on some maybe those uh, little more schematical things. Yep. Uh, I, I like the stat that you gave just before we started recording about um, what was what was uh, Spencer's so yardage the, uh, So in 2010 with Ricky, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, so I might be a little off. Ricky stands in 2010, which is probably the most complete quarterback season we've seen maybe going back to one of Tate's years or even back to Drew, Drew uh, not Drew, Brad Banks uh, back in 02. His yards per attempt were something like 7.1, 7.2 yards per attempt. Mm -hmm. Last year's quarterbacks, I believe, were in like the four, nine, five yards per attempt. And again, you're talking about two yards. That makes a big difference. You're completing more passes. You're gaining more yards. Those attempts go a long way. I mean, I just have the the vision of that one play where it's like it was, you know, what was it, like a third and two and they threw to um, – Laporta and he like it was a one yard pickup or something like that I mean yeah a lot of plays like that where it's like even the completion percentage doesn't tell the whole story because it's like yes that was a completed pass but it's like what <laughs> it didn't do you a dang bit of good the uh the 2013 stat and, and the fact that that was the lowest leading receiving total that we'd mm -hmm. seen with uh Cavante with 388 this is no slight against Jake Rudock dude went to Michigan and had an awesome senior year at Michigan and got to hang around in the league for a few years it was awesome he was very much known as a guy who would hit his checkdowns. He had a, a 60, low 60s completion percentage, and a lot of those were checkdowns. And once I knew that context, I'm like, yeah, if there was going to be a year where somebody led the team with 388 receiving yards, it might be uh, those Thor Schroeder throws. Um, certainly, I think that's when the memes started, if memes were even a thing back in 2013, of Greg Davis's uh, calls on third and five. But that's uh, – Another story for another time. That wraps up this episode of Eye on the Hawks. Next Sunday, we start making season predictions, and we start getting into – you didn't know that? We were, I mean, it's going to be game week. I'm following your lead, man. Let's, let's make week. some predictions. Again, this is Mike's thing. This is all him setting this up. So thanks to Mike Howell, Owen Sebring. I'm Mitch Fick. Episode 3 of Eye on the Hawks is in the books. Please subscribe, watch on YouTube, keep sharing the news, and we'll get ready to set the table for the 2023 season next time.